Um, so without uh, further ado, I wanted to introduce our, our next speaker for the day, um, Professor Rod Dunbar. Um, so Professor Dunbar is, uh, has a, both a medical degree and a PhD from uh, the University of Otago. Um, he's a, an expert in, in uh, human immunology. He spent some time at the University of Oxford. Um, in 2002, he came back on a uh, Wellcome Trust International Senior Research uh, Fellowship, and in 2008 was uh, appointed the director of the Morris Wilkins Institute. Um, actually, looking over uh, Professor Dunbar's um, bio, it's really quite impressive. Um, he's got in interests in um, immunology, uh, uh, lymphocytes, T cells, cancer therapy. Um, I, I actually checked him out on Google Scholar, and um, Rod's been cited 14,139 times, which I thought that's that's pretty that's a quite a quite a number. So that's really impressive. Um, I, I found this on his bio. Rod, it, quote: Rod's lab interacts with a wide collaborative network with particular strengths in organic and medicinal chemistry, tissue imaging, and computer modeling. So as someone uh, speaking about collaboration, I think um, you know, Rod's uh, an amazing candidate, and we're um, really grateful to, to have him here today. Um, so some of, you, some of you may know him from the television show. Uh, what's, what's that one called? <laughs> Stop. <laughs> Rod's, Rod's been featured on television playing the piano. Um, but here, we're going to hear him talk about collaboration and all of his work. So thank you very much for being here. <laughs> thank you. Oh, thank, thanks for that lovely introduction. The, uh, the TV show was the most unfortunate game show that I did after my PhD, uh, which was called Don't Tell Me, but uh, swiftly got dubbed by the press, Don't Watch Me. Uh, so fortunately, uh, there's no record of it in TVNZ archives, which is good. Um, anyway, great day and great to see so many people here. Um, great idea to get talking about collaboration. First of all, a check. Can everyone hear me up the back? Why have you? Good. Um, so I love collaboration. Um, I'm, a, I guess, a collaboration addict. Um, what I'm not really sure about is whether I do it especially well. And so today I'm going to give you um, a little view of my experience of collaboration, which is a, a fairly frank look at what worked and what perhaps didn't. Um, and particularly as we go, I want to um, uh, highlight the work of some very talented investigators. Three, uh, young Haley, Incan and Vaughan, and one perhaps not so young, your own Gib Vogel, uh, who's in the audience somewhere, um, and uh, give examples of how their projects really grew uh, out of desire to collaborate and, and what really happened subsequently. Um, the entire focus of my talk is really on uh, local and national collaborations, because when I came back from Oxford, um, I really felt that while it was relatively easy to generate international collaborations, actually for the New Zealand environment it's very important that we uh, grow our own collaborative networks and grow our own capability. And so my focus since I've been back has really been on finding great people to work with here and trying to build up um, projects that have great momentum and programs that engage lots of people in lots of different ways. So uh, there's almost nothing in my talk about international collaborations, it's all about New Zealand. So I thought I'd start with my collaborations with ABI and um, give you three examples of um, uh, work that uh, we've done together, um, and then talk about the Morris Wilkins Centre and how we approached encouraging and fostering collaboration. That's more a kind of a structural organisational thing, but I'll give you a couple of, ex of examples uh, where I think we're really starting to have impact because of our um, approach. And finally, some comments on um, successes and major fails uh, that I think you can have collaborating um, in three categories, what to look for for collaborations, what to avoid, uh, and how to adjust your own behaviour really to uh, collaboration because it's, it's quite different. So unfortunately I missed Nick's talk this morning, I was late, so um, apologies if uh, some of this overlaps, but um, hopefully you'll see a slightly different perspective. So first of all, my collaborations with ABI, and the first one I want to talk about was this one. This was with Hayley Reynolds, a uh, PhD student at ABI who was Morris Wilkins Centre funded and uh, supervised by uh, Nick Smith, who you just heard from. Um, and it started really with a, a medical idea. On the um, lower left there, you can see uh, a sketch with some sort of dots on it. And those dots are indicative of a clinical procedure called lymphocentigraphy. And what happens in lymphocentigraphy is you have uh, a melanoma on your body somewhere, and uh, the doctors want to track uh, where the draining lymph node is, the first lymph node that tumour cells might arrive in. As you know, tumours often move from uh, various sites in the body to the lymph nodes, and uh, when they do that, it's a good sign that the, the tumour started to spread, and, and actually a, a sign of trouble. And so one way that you can track um, where the lymph node, uh, the first lymph node is that um, the uh, melanoma will drain to, is to inject a radioactive tracer into the skin, 
and then you can track the passage of that radioactive tracer over an amazingly short time. It only takes a few minutes uh, with this colloidal um, formulation of the tracer uh, to be able to visualize it actually draining into the lymph nodes. So in fact, the radiologists watch this in real time. They watch uh, the, tra the, the tracer tracking. And interesting things uh, happen, like if uh, they have a melanoma on the back and they inject into the back, uh, if you are leaning against a chair, there's no tracking of the tracer through the lymphatics. As soon as you lean forward off the chair, uh, the, the, the trafficking starts again. So it's a, a really interesting way of actually seeing the function of the lymphatic system, which of course drains fluid from uh, all our tissues. Uh, and so what the uh, surgeons are after particularly is they want to know what the first lymph node is that's hit. Uh, by that tracer. And so as well as a radiative tracer in there, there's also a blue dye. And that means that the surgeons can uh, then, based on this information, this kind of picture, uh, cut the patient open and uh, go and find that first lymph node. And if they see a lot of blue dye there, they know that's the one to take out. And then the pathologists examine it to see uh, whether there's any melanoma in that lymph node. And that can change their, um, their treatment, particularly these days. Um, but uh, in, when I first looked at this in about 2005, 2006, I was in a meeting in Sydney with the Sydney Melanoma Unit, and all their data was like this. They had these uh, traces, <laughs> you know, that were these crude pictures. And it turned out they had 4,300 cases where they had injected tracer into different parts of the body where different melanomas arise. And they had this data, uh, which lymph node, which part of the body uh, that tracer drained to. And so I was looking at this and I started talking to Peter about potential collaborations with ABI. Uh, and I realised, of course, that you guys had the computational chops to be able to take all those single cases and combine them potentially into a map that could tell us something about uh, the actual patterns of lymphatic drainage all over the body. And so that's what Haley was tasked to do, and it was a horrendously difficult task, and it was only really because uh, of the skills of Nick, I think, that um, uh, she managed to get there, uh, and also, of course, her own tremendous persistence and intelligence. She was a very smart um, student. What she first had to do was build a three-dimensional model of the skin of humans. This was based on the visible human data set, and I, I, I'm guessing that probably the work that she did building this model is still being used in ABI by, by people. And then she had to uh, take the meshwork that she used to um, build that and build um, uh, descriptions of fields and uh, then map all this data to those particular fields and what she ended up producing was some gorgeous three-dimensional maps uh, which show the likelihood from any part of the human body uh, that uh, a particular lymph node will be drained to. And in some cases it's very simple. Uh, for example, the legs really only drain up to uh, the groin. Um, and so what this graph shows here is that pretty well anywhere on the, um, the upper leg anyway, uh, you're always drained to the groin. And other parts of the body is much more complicated and there can be four or five, even six lymph node basins uh, that the, um, the skin drains to. And that's really important clinical information because it's telling uh, the, the, the surgeons and the physicians where to look for metastases. And if the, if the melanoma occurs in some parts of the body, very difficult to predict exactly where that will drain to, and other parts of the body very simple to predict. And so these were um, very important um, data, and, and Haley also produced a gorgeous database where you can click on any uh, part of the body, and you can find out what the probabilities are of draining to uh, uh, lymph nodes in all these different sites. And here, for example, uh, 21 cases uh, of skin in this particular part of the body, and you can see that they're draining to all different lymph node basins over the, over the body, but you can see the probabilities, so uh, clinicians can use this tool uh, to map out e exactly where they should be looking for metastases. So it was a great success. Um, we uh, got some great papers out of it. Lancet Oncology took the first one uh, as well cited. Uh, very high impact paper. Um, the second paper, which was about the head and neck, uh, was in a lesser known journal, but still reasonably well cited. And there was some other work on the stats that um, Haley published. Um, uh, one of Haley's images ended up being turned into cover art, which is always a nice thing. Um, so seeing ABI's work on the front cover of this uh, great journal was very good. Um, so Haley and Nick, I think, has got some really interesting clinically oriented papers out of it, and it was possibly one of the um, the, the first times that uh, that certainly Nick had uh, had been engaged with this level of clinical data, I think. Um, and the Sydney Melanoma Unit, which later turned into the um, uh, Melanoma Institute of Australia were really delighted because basically they saw outstanding new visualisation of their clinical data that moved from black and white plots to these gorgeous three-dimensional things. Uh, they had this full 3D map to work from clinically. 
and they also have got high impact uh, publications. Now for me, uh, really transformer thinking about lymphatic drainage, so I now think about the lymphatic system in a completely new way because I can see it in 3D. Uh, but also, importantly, it initiated sustained collaboration with a very important group in the melanoma uh, field and uh, they've given us access to uh, amazing resources in Australia and really one of the reasons we got that was that John Thompson, the leader of that unit, remembered that we had delivered on a great collaboration and done something good for them and so we kind of trust it. So that was pretty successful all round. The only um, sort of sad thing really is that uh, we had hoped that we'd be able to build a live database that they'd be able to dump all their new data into so that the, the, the scale of the thing would continue to grow as they got new cases. And that didn't prove uh, feasible. We couldn't find funding for that. And uh, so really the project's still stuck in where it was in about 2010. And that's a bit of a shame, but there's still an opportunity to pick this up, I think, and run with it again. Second capital of the collaboration I want to talk about was uh, really down to this guy, Gib Bogle, um, brain the size of a planet. Um, and I got talking to Gib uh, early on, encouraged by Peter, about uh, doing some uh, multi uh, scale, multi level models of uh, immune activity. And so, in this model you're about to see a video of, uh, what Gib has done is taken an awful lot of um, in vivo data of immune cells moving around in lymph nodes, the same uh, tissues we've been talking about. And he's taken all those uh, parameters that have been recorded from intravital microscopy, which is a technique where you visualize in real time cells moving around and doing stuff. Uh, and he's uh, put all those parameters into a whole bunch of mathematical um, probabilities of what the cells will do at any one time. Uh, and then he's put those into a time scale model where um, cells move around in a stepwise fashion over a period of time. Uh, and he's done all that in the 3D lattice with all kinds of sneaky maths to uh, make it computationally efficient. And what you're going to see is um, a really gorgeous piece of video that shows uh, part of how his model works. And just describe uh, bits of it as we go. What you can see is a whole lot of green cells moving around. Um, and they're moving around what looks like uh, in a kind of random fashion. And they're in 3D, not in 2D. You're just seeing a 2D projection of it. Uh, but in fact, they're conforming to a thing called the random walk. And the random walk is a particular kind of motility, and it's what has been observed in uh, vivo uh, of these T cells. And what the T cells are doing is they're scanning those red cells, uh, looking for the antigen to which they can respond. And what you see uh, if you follow some of those uh, green cells is every once in a while they'll stop on one of those big red cells and they'll change colour. They'll go uh, orange, which indicates that they're uh, taking signals from those uh, dendritic cells. Uh, and eventually, over the course of uh, quite a long period of time, they'll start to uh, sum those signals and eventually divide uh, and uh, form an immune response. The uh, red cells, meantime, have different colour intensities in them, and this is to indicate that uh, different uh, cells have different levels of antigen. When uh, microbes arrive into the lymph nodes, uh, they get gobbled up by these cells called dendritic cells, and different dendritic cells will have different amounts of antigen in them. And so it gives managed to simulate a distribution of antigen uh, distribution in those cells as well. Now, the amazing thing about this model was that um, it worked, uh, and it showed immediately that a lot of the theories about how random motility in lymph nodes could drive an immune response were probably correct, because as you put the maths in, it became obvious that randomly moving T cells around and bouncing them off these, uh, these cells that might have bits of microbes in them was a fantastic way to generate an immune response. And there was still controversy in the literature at the time about whether random motility was enough or whether cells that had picked up uh, microbes had to somehow attract T cells in. And still in the literature, it's beginning, uh, people are still saying there's some form of attraction going on, but personally, based on this data, I really don't believe that. You don't need to have attraction, chemo attraction in the lymph nodes to generate an immune response. And what Gib managed to do was really take all the molecular rules and put them into a spatial context so that we could actually visualize what was going on. Now it's important to note that actually as well as these green ones moving around, uh, there are actually a whole lot of unlit T cells in that grid which can't respond to that particular antigen that's being simulated here. And so he's actually got a very large number of cells all moving around uh, in this random walk. So it turns out it's a very sophisticated model um, and it's been well regarded in the literature, um, uh, increasing citations over time. Uh, it's a very small field so we don't expect massive numbers of citations but increasingly people in the field look at this as a real uh, benchmark, a tremendous uh, piece of work really. 
Um, and so uh, some of the other outcomes for us were, I think Gib got some nice speaking and networking invitations, he can comment afterwards about what, he, what else he got out of it, but he got to go to uh, Los Alamos and various other uh, very cool places as uh, partly linked to this work. Uh, and it also led to a sustained new collaboration with another group. And one of the reasons that I'm not still working with Gib on this uh, was that I made a mistake. And one of the mistakes I made in this was that the experimental data that we used to generate this model was somebody else's. It came from another lab. And when it came to wanting to iterate the model and do experiments, uh, we found that we really just couldn't do that. Um, it requires very sophisticated microscopy in animals, and we work largely in human tissues. And so one of the problems with the project uh, longer term was that when we got to establishing the model and getting it really cooking, uh, I couldn't provide the experimental wherewithal to continue the development of that. And so Gib had to go on to some other work. And I think that's a lesson I'll come back to a bit later. Meantime, it was great for me. Transformer thinking about lymph nodes gave me some lovely papers and uh, also got me a bit thinking a bit more quantitatively, which was uh, very useful. Last one I want to talk about is uh, involving these people. This is Inkin Kelsch, who was, uh, again, NWC uh, sponsored student. And this is her getting her uh, supreme award uh, two years ago from the Biomedical um, Imaging Research Unit uh, for the best piece of imaging across the entire university that year. And here's uh, Greg Sands and uh, Ian LeGrice, who developed a thing called the RIG, uh, which is the wonderful 3D visualization tool uh, that we've got up in um, the, uh, the med school, but it's really run by ABI people. And here's an example of um, some of the imaging we managed to do in this collaboration. Uh, this is the same tissue again, a lymph node, but this time uh, the individual cells are visualized within that lymph node uh, across the entire organ. And because of the way that microscope is cleverly being built by uh, Ian's team, uh, we get uh, seamless integration of uh, confocal images across millimetres of tissue. And so you can see every single macrophage sitting in the sinuses of the cell, these are the, of the um, uh, lymph node, this is only about two millimetres wide and every single cell is, uh, uh, is seen. You can also see the channels uh, that bear antigen to those macrophages and in a moment you'll see the vasculature which is this gorgeous uh, network uh, which I can visualise using a new staining technique and give, uh, has modelled uh, so that we can see all the folds and wefts and warps and, and quantify how the vasculature is built. And this is, uh, as far as we can tell, the most, the densest and most intricate microvascular network ever published. Uh, it had something like 16,000 uh, segments to it, uh, and amazing complexity which we could uh, track and color code. Uh, so it's a real landmark piece of work. Um, first paper was out end of last year, uh, 2015, um, and only three citations so far, but here are kind of the page views coming out of um, scientific reports. It's in the middle of uh, what you'd expect for scientific reports. So it's getting good attention, and I think in the end it's gonna be uh, extremely well cited. Other outcomes for us so far, oh, there are other pi papers in the pipeline in CNE, so we've got the second and third ones uh, in development. The second one should go relatively soon. Um, I hope uh, that this is correct. The RIG team, Greg, Dane, Ian, uh, I think we extended the capabilities of the RIG because we uh, used um, Incan's time to really develop new stains that could work on the RIG, and I think that was really, really um, useful um, because we pushed what the RIG could achieve, really, I think. Um, we generate some fantastic new image processing tools all down to uh, Gib, but Gib often working with Greg on how to handle the data, uh, and Incan doing a lot of the donkey wor work. And hopefully the prize is that Incan's won. She's also won uh, an international prize at a, at a conference. Um, it makes some difference as well. For Gib, I'm not quite sure, so sure. He may comment later about what the outcome, uh, outcomes of this were, uh, because really, uh, you know, he had to expand his already very large brain into 3D imaging, which was good, uh, and won some prizes. Uh, but again, we had some difficulties with um, pursuing the technique in, into um, uh, wider programs, and partly that's because of the particular technology we're using. It's, it's not high throughput enough yet to do multiple experiments to be able to do uh, very large biological replicates. So uh, again, didn't really think through what was going to happen at the end of the project. And so um, this project is really currently on hold. We've established a new benchmark and techniques, uh, but not quite sure um, that we'll be able to continue working with this particular technique and this particular tissue. Uh, meantime, though, it transformed my thinking about imaging and lymph node uh, structure, so I did um, very well out of this. Uh, and uh, it's still a fantastic technical benchmark, I think, for the university and for, and for my work. So that's just three examples of uh, what we've done with ABI personnel. And um, next few minutes, I just want to deal with more structural things about what Morris Wilkins Centre uh, has done to encourage collaboration. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples of um, some collaboration that we've um, recently 
uh, had some success with. So this is the Morris Wilkins Centre. Uh, hopefully most of you know this. We're interdisciplinary uh, and we're focused on therapies particularly. Uh, we join together all these institutes and that's a really important thing because uh, that national reach is now uh, what we need to do to build uh, New Zealand's capabilities. And we have spent a bit of time tracking interactions between our investigators, so I'll show you a little bit of data about that later. Um, here are our investigators. We have um, a team of uh, 10 in the management committee who make the decisions. We've got three founding members who also help advise us, including Peter. And we've got uh, newer investigators coming on who will be the next leadership. Um, 151 labs around the country um, uh, also contribute. So it's quite a big network. And the idea is to bring together our best scientists and clinicians to target diseases uh, across a range of scientific disciplines. And all of this involves collaboration. Uh, it's about linking fundamental research through to translation, and that requires collaboration, particularly with clinicians. It's about developing leaders, and we have to teach leaders how to use collaborative resources. And it's about opening up international opportunities, and that's also collaborative, although I'm not going to really deal with that. And part of the thing uh, that makes this particular field really uh, special and, and needing of collaboration is this. Uh, if you really want to develop a therapeutic, you need many, many different uh, fundamental disciplines, particularly medicinal chemistry, uh, the kinds of things that are actually going to deliver your final product. But you also need fundamental things, molecular biology, cell biology, structural biology. And so all of these have to be combined to basically um, target diseases. And the diseases we target are cancer, diabetes, and infectious disease at the moment. But potentially, once you've got the engine running, you can target anything you like. So um, the other thing we realised was that as part of what we do, we also wanted to innovate technically. It's important to be pushing your technology so that you can uh, get patentable stuff if you want um, translation. And so part of our programme also encourages people just to get together and develop new combined technologies uh, from across their different disciplines. So here's how we function. It's all about collaboration. Uh, and basically, we try and get people together to talk about problems and capabilities. It's about matching the capabilities across our network with a problem to solve. And then once we get an idea out of that network, uh, people put a proposal to us, which is a concept. We provide seed funding. Out of that come uh, training for students and postdocs, publications, but also, uh, importantly, intellectual property uh, that's handled through the tech transfer offices, much like the MedTech Corps, and this can lead to clinical trials. And we actually embed that in our processes. So, for example, here's Category 2 funding, which is offered twice a year. This is student support. Uh, and it insists that uh, one of the criteria is you must have at least two NWC investigators, and they have to be in more than one discipline. You don't get funded unless you've got that interdisciplinary thing. So we actually mandate interdisciplinarity and collaboration before you get funding. Um, and to enable that around the country, we also fund, fund uh, travel, so many of our students end up bouncing between labs and spending good periods in labs, uh, particularly in New Zealand, but also sometimes overseas. And even in the application form, you have to say things like this, how does an interdisciplinary approach actually help your project? So the question is, does this work? Has it incentivised collaboration? Well, here's the first bit of evidence. This is this network kind of diagram. And here's where we were in 2003, based around the five principal investigators at the time and uh, their collaborators. And Peter Hunter is one of these, and I can't remember which one he is. Uh, but you can see the network is collect, uh, connected, but there are a few isolated clusters where uh, there wasn't much connectivity. Uh, when we tracked it again for tw in 2012 for this bid document for the rebuild, we had a much more developed network. And uh, our recent data, which I haven't had time to plot, is that we've got real intensification in terms of the interactions around the country. And part of that is just that you offer money, people will follow. Um, but the other part of it is that eventually in these meetings that you have, uh, where you are describing a problem and asking who has the capability to address it, people want to pile in. I think there is this need uh, that many of us have to be part of something larger and working with other people on a larger scale project uh, is a really appealing thing. And so, um, in fact, one of the most valuable things we do is just organising our thematic meetings. And they've become uh, must-go-to meetings in the particular fields. For example, in tuberculosis, good example, we had um, in the early stages of the Morris Wilkins Centre about 13 different targets, molecular targets, that different people around the country were working on. Uh, and they're all working slightly independently, uh, sometimes linked up, but often not. We brought them all together to a meeting where we brought over some international experts from Colorado State University, and magically those 13 targets uh, suddenly got ranked, and the people working on the targets that people agreed were never going to uh, actually deliver a drug uh, decided that rather than continue to work on those targets, they'd throw their efforts into a collaborative effort around some uh, more likely targets. And so that prioritisation project has meant that now we've got two, maybe three priority targets, 
and the whole country is really working, working towards those. And that's, I think, a good thing. I think it's uh, the... Um, it, it counters the fragmentation that I think the New Zealand science system is generating. So that's the first bit of evidence. Uh, second bit of evidence from a couple of my own projects, and this is the typical um, uh, drug discovery pipeline, uh, all the way from defining your disease process and your targets, all the way to selecting uh, compounds for a phase one clinical trial. And in 2004, I really started my very first real serious chemistry collaboration with Margaret Brimble, uh, and uh, that produced eight papers over subsequent years. Uh, working with Margaret is fantastic, as you, many of you know, um, an outstanding and, and uh, absolute the um, internationally leading medicinal chemist. Um, but it was interesting trying to learn her language because um, the first time I went to her and said, here's my design for a vaccine construct, she looked at it and said, I'm not making that. Uh, okay. Uh, why not? Um, well, a machine can do that. Oh, okay. Uh, so I went away and I added a whole lot of bits and baubles onto the edge of the molecule and made it much more sophisticated, took that to her, and she said, we'll make that. That's a good paper. So it was a really interesting language thing in terms of the molecular descriptions. Uh, what Margaret really wants to do as a chemist is, is, is challenge her chemistry. And so I had to learn that uh, we needed to get into new space uh, chemically uh, in order to solve the problems that I wanted to if Margaret was to be involved. And of course what that led to uh, was the next thing, which is a pivotal patent application because Margaret had described suddenly some fantastic new chemistry, actually really pioneered by a, a student called Tom Wright who's just uh, been in Oxford and doing very well over there and is just writing up his PhD at the moment. Uh, so we filed a patent in 2013 on this technology and it's a method for um, taking a protein that I want to target uh, and we pull out um, peptide sequences from that that are um, uh, immunogenic. And then Margaret's chemistry, very clever chemistry developed by Tom and Jeff uh, Williams and others, uh, clips on an adjuvant molecule that makes this molecule look like it's bacterial. Effectively, what they've done is come up with a very clever chemistry uh, for clipping on what looks like cell wall components uh, onto that peptide. And so suddenly something the body's been ignoring, uh, the body suddenly starts to take uh, interest in. And one of the really cool things about the technology was that Tom found an off-the-shelf component, which is very commonly available and cheap, uh, which nobody had guessed would look like a cell wall, and found out a way to uh, modify that so it could be clipped straight onto the, the peptide. Subsequently, we developed um, manufacturing facilities. So in SBS, we have a GMP lab that's actually licensed by MedSafe to produce medicines. Uh, and so this is Jeff making peptides for a current clinical trial. These are non-adjuvant peptides, but they're, being in tri they're in trial at the moment um, in uh, the Maligan. And just this year, uh, we founded a new company with US funding called Satvax LLC, and there's the uh, web address if you want to look it up. And we've got now substantial funding from the US to take uh, these products all the way through, uh, not just phase one, but potentially through uh, into a phase two trial as well. Now, the important thing about that is that this is a long process. It's taken, you know, it's going to take in the end probably 15 years to go from the initial collaborations right through. But we would never be here had it not been for the Morris Wilkins Centre incentivising interdisciplinary collaboration and incentivising us to learn each other's languages and each other's problems. Last um, one I want to hi highlight is a, a second company that we've been fortunate to spin out. Um, actually just before Christmas we did this one, it's called Upside Biotechnologies and it's based on Vaughan Feist's uh, work from my lab. And this is a different kind of collaborative thing because it's really been driven out of our lab uh, but we've reached out to collaborators as we need it. Um, and in fact we're just about to close our first round of funding and the reason I'm wearing this is not because of you guys, uh, it's because I'm talking to Icehouse tonight um, in the final uh, round of our, uh, of our fundraising, but it's gone extremely well. Um, and what we're making is um, living human skin. And the thing that makes that living human skin really interesting is it's got all the normal layers and they're properly differentiated because of the culture technique we've developed. And they're grown from a patient's own cells, so it takes time, but importantly, this is an autologous product that's gonna be able to be used uh, to actually treat uh, patients without any fear of rejection. Uh, and it's designed to treat major burns. We've got faster delivery uh, of skin than all the, um, the pipeline competition. Uh, we can now build bigger sheets of skin up to 20 by 20, which is a huge uh, sheet of skin. And we've got our handling and robustness that was built into the, the product. And uh, how do we know that it's good? Well, so far the conversations in the US have gone extremely well, and we're about to sign a collaboration agreement with the US Army, who are very interested in the technology for uh, obvious reasons. Um, 
what did we uh, do to get this going? Well, the idea is actually sprang from the same project I've just told you about, from the vaccine project. We started off looking at skin because we were interested in how vaccines were handled by skin. Um, but then we talked to plastic surgeons and we said, well, we're getting all the skin and we're using all these cells. How can you use cells in your practice? And so they started to tell us about the problems they had with skin culture. Skin cells have been used for many years to try and fix burns, but the plastic surgeons hate the products because uh, thin sheets of uh, skin cells are too fragile. They arrive at them in weird ways. The surgeons can't handle them. They put them on the burns and they, they're just like not even glad wrap thickness, they just kind of crumple up. So they asked us to develop a product which was robust and which had certain characteristics. And so that was embedded into the project right from the start. So if it hadn't been for that collaborative link with the clinicians, we'd never have built it, obvious, I guess. But as we built it um, and we developed these new cell, cell culture techniques, we discovered we needed a new substrate uh, to grow the cells on. So we talked to Yadranka, uh, Brian, uh, and developed some pilot studies and eventually went out to Revolution Fibres, great uh, niche New Zealand manufacturer. Uh, and they're now building the product for us. Uh, we needed new coatings for that substrate to make the cells cell stick properly, and Jenny Malmstrom we'd worked with before, uh, another materials chemist. Uh, and now Jeff Williams and Margaret Brimble's group are helping with that as well. And we also needed to build a new cell culture device, and um, many of you will know there's a fantastic manufacturer called Adept, who do all the work for FMP Healthcare. Uh, and so we went straight to them and they built the device. It seemed to us along the way that it was very easy to grow this very complex project, but actually, looking back, uh, it was because we had networks. And because of all the people we've been working with, the medicinal chemists, the material chemists, and increasingly industrial partners, uh, it was easy to move from one step to another. And so I think you can't move quickly uh, with these product developments until you have those connections and those networks. And we're now used to being able to do the collaborative deals to engage people, which I think is also really, really important. So that project, I think, is another example of the success of network building that we've undertaken. Uh, and um, we're now looking forward to taking this through to the clinic. Just uh, final comments in the last few minutes. Um, success and fail, what to look for, what to avoid, how to adjust. What to look for, um, why do you collaborate? Well, I've often collaborated because of opportunity. I've seen something really cool that we could do together uh, using some of your technology. But I think a better thing to think about is more need, and I think that was mentioned at the end of the last session. If you have a need for something, as we did with the skin product, where you cannot progress it, the collaboration is, if you can engage, going to be very valuable uh, for you particularly, and you're going to be extremely motivated. I think you also have to think about your own capacity because um, in my case I've clearly initiated far too many collaborations and I can't service them all as well as I should and so you have to think about your capacity for collaboration and increasingly now in my team I've got people who are great collaborators because they're used to this thing and so they manage those collaborations for us. Who do you want to co collaborate with? Obviously you want to collaborate with talented people, find the best people you possibly can, and that means for us looking around New Zealand um, to try and build out these local networks. But also you've got to think about the enjoyment. Collaborate with people that you really like being with because it's a long process and it's much more fun uh, playing with people you like. Why do you collaborate on? Um, I think you want to think about dazzling people. I think you want to collaborate on the stuff that's really going to be major advances. The Skin Project is fantastic because we've produced something magical that nobody else in the world has got. That's what I like about collaborative opportunities. Think of something that, uh, the best possible thing you can think of and shoot for that. But, as I've alluded to, you also want to think about how, what legs the project has on it. Because if you're uh, collaborating on a project that has a really well thought out long term vision, it will grow and grow and grow and gather resources. And I think in some of the projects I've alluded to, we got to the first stage and then thought, ah, if we now want to grow this into a major program, we have a couple of limitations. We don't have the right experimental techniques, we don't have the right collaborators, we don't have the right resourcing. And so then the risk is that you'll do brilliant work that will then sit in the literature and you won't be able to develop it. And I think that's a problem. How do you uh, do collaboration? Well, I think it's important to plan. You have to uh, set out a formal plan of how you want to do it. Have, we haven't always done that, and I think it's a problem. You have to agree on key parameters, and that includes things like um, rights. Who has the right to pub publish? Um, what's the authorship order going to be? Uh, what's going to happen if you patent stuff? Who's going to have... Um, the, which tech transfer office is going to uh, progress your stuff. It's important to agree those things right up front, and it's hard to do that, but if you don't do that, you'll come to your first paper and you'll find the 
problems. There are mismatched expectations, as we'll talk about in a sec. And finally, uh, you want to track and put out. You want to actually make sure you're tracking the progress of the collaboration, and you need to have outputs. You need to think about what kind of outcomes are important for the collaboration, and you want to achieve those. So the counter to that, what to avoid pain, mismatched expectations is very painful when one partner thought that it was their project and you thought it was yours, uh, when one partner thought they were senior and first author and you were squished in the middle and you don't agree, uh, when a patent application comes along and the people that contributed 0.2% to it suddenly want ownership of the patent, these are problems, um, so avoid those. Mismatch people, seriously, work with people that you can work with, or alternatively, uh, learn how teams work and learn what what your role in is the new team in the new team is, uh, so that you can adjust your own behaviour. And finally, technical ridiculousnessnessness. Um, some projects that you might consider uh, feasible are simply not, and it's really worth really robustly road testing them before you set particularly students off on these crazy collaborative paths, because in collaboration there are acres of uh, unanswered and unaddressed space uh, that projects can fall into. Uh, when you're working with people in different technical fields, sometimes you don't understand what their full technical capability is, and uh, there can be real technical problems along the way. Avoid fizzlers and stinkers. Uh, fizzlers are the ones that go up and get to a great point and then fizzle out. Stinkers are just stank right from the start. <laughs> Finally, uh, avoid overcommitment. If you're a widespread collaborator, don't do uh, too much because you won't be able to service all those collaborations. Last slide, how to adjust. Personally, if you do lots of collaboration, you will need to learn new languages. You'll need to learn how to talk to your biologists and your doctors and your chemists and understand what they're interested in. You'll need to be an attentive partner. Um, often collaborations are referred to as relationships. Uh, Bill Wilson at the uh, Auckland Cancer Centre often says that they, they, they're like a marriage, and uh, he's not a polygamist. He has very sh uh, small numbers of collaborations. One key one, uh, like a marriage, and he wants to make, pay full attention to that. Um, I'm far more, I guess, um, there are lots of words you could use. <laughs> They're say promiscuous in my um, <laughs> in my collaborations. Uh, but you have to decide what, decide what kind of person you are and what you need out of the relationships as well as what the other person does. Realise that you may no longer be in charge once the thing kicks off. Um, you may start something, but it may assume a life of its own. Don't assume that you can control it. Make sure you complete, um, think about what completion steps there are and aim for them and make sure you hit them. There's nothing worse than a collaboration which in, uh, absorbs a lot of energy on both sides and then doesn't have any defined endpoints. And finally, realising that what you create, your creature, may want a life of its own. You may just have to let it go because other people grab hold of it and run with it. Uh, and that can be quite hard sometimes if you thought of the idea and then it's got a life of its own, but you have to be prepared for that in the end. Finally, some thanks, lots of collaborators. Apologies to those that um, I may have missed off the slide, but key ones, uh, key collaborators in uh, ABI are listed here. Fantastic groups of people who really love working with. Surgeons, Anthony Phillips and Michelle Locke. Materials chemists are definitely part of our network now, and obviously the, the hardcore med chemists as well um, are part of that collaboration. And I think finally, the nicest thing about all of this is not what it does for me, it's actually what it does for the younger people coming through. There, in my lab, all our scientists are now introduced, as I think was mentioned in the intro, to this wide collaborative network, this world of possibilities where they can select from a range of different techniques to progress their projects. And that's what I really hope for New Zealand, is that eventually our whole ecosystem will get to the point that we recognise we have tremendous depth of skills here, and that young people are moving around from opportunity to opportunity with a vision that says, I can access this, that and that, and put together something absolutely magical. And that's the essence of collaboration. Thank you. It's still controversial. Well, I think no. Um, in fact, I have a collaboration with Nigel um, Birch, who's here, where we talk about this regularly, and we're actually working on how T cells um, do sniff uh, potential chemokine molecules. But so far, we don't have any evidence that we can point to of our own or in the literature that T cells actually do this. Neutrophils, you're absolutely right. They will hone in on a source of bacterial um, signals. Uh, they'll just zoom in, and you can see that in vivo. 
T cells generally are wandery, and I think it's because the wandering allows them to scan uh, certain p parts of the geometry, and that randomness is what assures you that the rare T cells that can recognise an antigen will eventually bump into the antigen if it's there, because they're programmed to zip around like that. And I think that's really what Gibbs' model really showed me, was that we don't need uh, chemotaxis for T cells to get really good uh, immune responses. Randomness is a great way to do it. Thank uh, Professor Dunbar again.